Mark, is it's a brand new 32 gig, so it's just a catch. Asian woman in her 50s. She's the mother of Austin and is a racist and is against the idea of Austin and Tracy being together. And then Austin is a white, is a young white man who's 24 and is in love with Tracy despite their different upbringings. So this will start out with the camera focusing on a television and pans out to a medium shot of Tracy and Austin sitting on the couch together. Bonnie enters the room shocked to see her son beginning to become intimate with Tracy. Oh my word, I leave you alone for, in this godforsaken mansion for one minute, and I come back to find you two almost canoodling on this couch. What the hell is this? My little boy, I thought I raised you better, to, raised you better than to get, in, get with some Negro trollop. Mama, do you really have to talk to her like that? Why does your skin color make her any less of a woman? Why couldn't you just stay with a gal that's your own color? Whatever happened to Beth? You need to find someone put together, not some ghetto tramp. The camera cuts to a close to a close-up shot of Tracy's face as she grasps as she gasps at things Bonnie has said. Um, the camera follows her as she gets up to Bonnie's face gets up to Bonnie's fa face Bonnie's racist comments. Let me tell you something. I may be from the other side of the train tracks, but that don't mean a thing about me. I just I have just as much class as you prim and proper crackers. Who are you calling a cracker, you queasy from the sticks? Mama, I don't care what color her skin is. Tracy is different than the other girls I've been with. Tracy makes me happy, and know what? I love her. There, I said it. I don't know what has gotten into that convoluted brain of yours, but we didn't raise you to get with you a cotton picker. You get out of my house. Fine, if that's how it has to be. Okay, so that's the end of scene one. So scene two is the camera follows Tracy and Austin as they exit through the door. Then we cut to Tracy holding Austin's arm as they walk down the street. It is, it is in the dark streets of Atlanta, but the sidewalk is illuminated by street lamps, and Austin and Tracy discuss the events that transpired with Bonnie. Thanks for standing up. Um, for me against your mama. It's nice to know that you got my back. Anything for you, my sweet darling. You are worth it to me, and I don't care how many people how many people tell us that we shouldn't be together. I know we can make it. I don't get why she's like that. She doesn't even like her coffee black. Oh, honey, you are too funny. I love you. I hope your mama will, will like me someday, because you mean the world to me, and I want to be with you for the rest of my life. I love you too, sweetheart. My mama will like you, just not right away. It takes her some time to warm up to people. But once you spend more time together, I swear she will love you like another daughter. <laughs> and the scene ends with Austin and Tracy walking into the sunset in the distance. And then this is the last scene that we wrote for this. So this is scene three, where the camera pans into the kitchen where Austin is making dinner for Bonnie and Tracy. Meanwhile, Tracy and Bonnie are in the living room setting the tables together and trying to get to know each other a little bit more. Thanks for having me. This means a lot. Don't get your nigger niggers twisted in a bunch. Just because I'm eating with y'all don't mean I think you're right for my Austin. Something funny? I was just thinking of my mama. She acted the same way when she first met my brother's baby mama. She was awful, always asking for money, even after they weren't together anymore. Ugh, it's crazy what them girls do for money. Yeah, I know. She didn't even start coming around that much till she found out my dad started his record label. I remember when Austin's brother got his ex pregnant. Uh, she was the same way. We don't always have money. Or we didn't always have money. When my honey's business took off, uh, that strumpet only saw him for our family's money. You know what? You're all, you're all right. Wow, I'm glad to see you two are getting along better now. Two of my favorite ladies in my life are now on better terms. Good news, the peach cobbler is ready. Okay, so that is all <coughs> our script. So thank you to our lovely volunteers. And then um, any questions for the floor? Questions? Fire away. Okay, yeah. So the, this is the end of your presentation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, so end of presentation, just say, you know, thank you for your time. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay, so thank you for your time, I you say. Do you have any questions? You are now film executives. Part of your grade for this course is participation. Right now, this is your last chance to participate 
by asking questions that you would ask if you were a studio executive and it was your job to make the right decision about whether to invest what now, as I mentioned before, is you know average of somewhere around $100 million to make a movie, okay? Even cheap indie movies cost a lot of money. Okay, so ask questions that you would ask if your neck's on the line on this decision. Ben, um, I would just ask why you chose to go the route you did, like with you know African Americans instead of you know something a little more conventional, especially like adding the racism element into it and all of that. Um, I think recently, over the past year or so, like I said earlier, um, <coughs> Black Lives Matter is becoming an increasing thing. Like even my 17-year-old sister said she wanted to go to a protest one day, and my parents went later, obviously. But like, pe like more generations are getting involved. And, like it's not just our age or people older. Like even like younger people are getting involved. So it's something that every age group can either relate to or feel uh, involved to participate in. So I think racism, especially after the election, whether it is because of Donald Trump or not. Um, after this election in general, racism was, I feel like was elevated, and I think it was a, it's a good time period to bring the issue about. Yeah. All right, well, if you're going to make money with this film, you know, you got to appeal to a wide range of audiences, so how are you going to get people to the theater to see this film? Um, one good way of advertising would be something similar to Empire. Um, they're also known for their music album, too, because the show produces the music that they put in the show, too, and that's something we would consider also because um, Kiki Palmer and is known for her musical talents as well. And if we're basing it off of artists or similar to that, Nicki Minaj and Beyonce, who are hugely successful and maybe like similar, we would incorporate the popular hip hop kind of feel of um, Atlanta. And like hip hop and R&B are also a very popular music genre for people around here too. So it, it, I think that genre is very widespread. <coughs> what type of rating do you think you're going to put on this because of the small bit of language that we already saw? I mean, ratings, I've noticed um, in more recent movies are getting a lot more casual. Um, I would probably say PG-13 maybe. Yeah. And depending on the rest of our script development, maybe R, depending on how deep we get into the racism, but yes. So do you, do you plan to s just stick pretty much note for note to the plot of Pride and Prejudice, or are there any twists or changes to the plot? Um, I think- there are Wickham and all that kind of stuff. Right, I think, um, in the, in, early in the presentation, we mentioned how among many suitors, she falls in love with, uh, with Austin. So um, we just didn't, we, we didn't include it in this scene, but she would fall in love with many other people, um, other people that her father would produce with, the, with his record label, or people, someone, someone that she fell in love with back in the hood, so to speak, in, in, the, in the inner city part of Atlanta. So there would be many other people that either would fit her lifestyle more, per se, according to both families' norms, or, um, and yeah, so we would twist some things, but because I feel like millennials, half of them, in my opinion, <coughs> um, like things like Pride and Prejudice in classic literature, and some of them stray away from it. So I think by adding twists and certain elements, it, it appeals to both sides of the spectrum. So, yeah. I have a couple questions. Sure. <laughs> um, so first of all, you mentioned um, you weren't exactly sure how deep you would go into the topic of racism. So. You know, as someone who's looking to produce this, how would you combat that? Because we don't want to get too involved in it, like offend people. Right. So like, it goes both ways. How are you going to keep and like relay a message to people you might even call racists? I think we would focus on making the movie um, less offensive towards one side mm -hmm. and make it more bring to light the things that you don't see in the media because the media mm -hmm. always shows just bad things on both sides. So just Black Lives Matter, for example, all I ever read is bad things about cops and bad things about the Black Lives Matter people. When although those are bad and need to be heard about, a lot of times they're also extremists of the group. And not every cop is bad, and not every Black Lives member or African American person is bad also. So I think the movie would focus more on bringing to light the full issue of African American discrimination versus just the bad. And would that take away at all um, from your message? Like, down, or you just like focusing overall? Um, if you notice at the end of our of the uh, um, of our third part of our of our mm -hmm. live um, script reading, um, Bonnie and Tracy start to sort of get along more. Mm -hmm. So I think by including elements like that, it shows how the two sides 
um, can kind of mesh together and start to at least accept one another, whether or not they believe in lifestyles or whatever their issue may be, they can sort of start to mesh with one another. We just have time for one really quick more question because we probably need to you know, move on to the next group and sure. just, you know, get too wildly off schedule. Sure. All right. If you are avoiding diving too deep into the racism issues by like trying to show both sides, are you afraid it's going to be taken that you're just writing off the success and the popularity of the Black Lives Matter group? And how would you combat that if that was the case? Like it was taken that way. Um, I think that music would be an important outlet for that because music goes for any skin color. Music, any country, any city, any place, there's different genres, there's music, any, all the genres apply to different types of people. So I think music would be a good medium to kind of tie it all together. Does that make sense? And we would still try and focus on like the love story part of it as well. Right. That's like our main focus. And okay. towards like we have to kind of try and because like the last thing that we did would be like a little bit past like the middle of the movie and right. it would end up with like um, Tracy and Bonnie like becoming like very close and very like having a good relationship at the end. That was kind of where we're going with that. What so, one of the that. things to keep in mind, just as like a, a, a last comment before we move on to the next group, is that if I'm a if I'm a, a studio executive with this kind of thing, um, I would probably be very concerned, or what I would be want to be assured of, is that in its well-meaning attempt to deal with, you know, racial discrimination, that the film inadvertently, uh, sort of inadvertently slipped into stereotypes. <coughs> And because what often happens is even well-meaning things 